you and me, slow dance later, right? <laughs> he had that look, like, okay. <laughs> know who you playing with. Uh, anyway, anyway, well, thank you. Anise, you're constantly astound astounding. It's, that was an amazing set, and it's an honor to read with you. It's nice to be here, nice to see so many friends in the audience. Um, make sure I keep track of time here. All right. So I teach at this college in uh, Staten Island, New York, and I can never get any of my students to write, which is kind of an essential part of being in college. <laughs> uh, so I have to play tricks on them and try to sneak through the back door before they know that they've written something. So I turn it into mathematical exercises sometimes. So I ask them um, what their most difficult age was. So what was your most difficult age? That's, wow, <laughs> I did not hire these people. Uh, so so I, the consensus was 13. And when you think about it, you know, your skin has erupted, your voice is changing, there's like weird southern region things going on down here. <laughs> you haven't quite figured it out yet. So I told them, I said, whatever it is that I gave you for um, your final, forget it. Forget it, we're not gonna do that. Your, your new final is this. I want you to write a poem about being 13. I want it to be 13 stanzas, 13 lines each stanza, and 13 syllables in each line. And that was their new final. <laughs> and of course, when I gave it to them, I had to do the same thing. My 13 was nothing like their 13. But there are some things that are universal. So uh, I'm gonna skip around in this a little bit for time's sake, but this is 13 ways of looking at 13. One, you touch your forefinger to the fat clots in the blood, then lift its iron stench to look close, searching the globs of black scarlet for the dimming swirl of dead children. You thread one thick pad's cottony tail, then the other through the little steel guides of the belt. You stand and lift the contraption, press your thighs close to adjust the bulk, then bend to pull up coarse white cotton panties bleached blue, and just to be safe, you pin the bottom of the pad to the shredding crotch of the carters. Then you spritz the guilty air with the cloying kiss of FDS. It's time to begin the game of justifying ache. Time to name the mystery prickling right in your skin. You're convinced the boys can smell you, and they can. Three. Miss Stein scribbled a word on the blackboard, said, who can pronounce this? And the word was anemone. And from that moment, you first felt the clutter of possible in your mouth. From the time you stumbled through the rhythm and she slow smiled, you suddenly knew you had the right to be explosive, to sling syllables through back doors, to make up your own damn words if you needed them. All that day, sweet anemone tangled in your teeth, spurted sugar tongue, led you to the dictionary where you were assured that it still existed, to the cave of the bathroom where you warbled it and bounced echo, and finally, convinced that you own that teeny gospel, you wrote it again and again and again and a four. Trying hard to turn hips to slivers, sway to stutter. You walk past the Sinclair station where lanky boys, dust in their hair, dressed in their uniforms of oil and thud, rename you pussy with their eyes. They bring sound, shudder, and blue from their throats just for you. Serve up ancient sonata of skin drum and conch shell. Sing suggesting woos of AM radio. Boom, boom, how you just gonna walk on by like that? And suddenly you know why you are stitched so tight, crammed like a flash bomb into pinafore, obeying your mama's instructions to be a baby as long as you can. Because it's a man's world, and James Brown is gasoline, the other side of slow zippers. He is all of it, the pump, pump, the growled, please, please, please. Five. You try to keep your hands off your face, but the white-capped pimples just might harbor evil. <laughs> it looks like something cursed is trying to escape your cheeks. Your whole soul could be involved. <laughs> so you pinch, squeeze, and pop. Let the smelly snow splash the mirror. Slather your fresh-scarred landscapes with creams that clog and strangle. 
At night, you look just like someone obsessed with the moon, its gruff superstitions, and its lies. Your skin is a patchwork of wishing. You scrub and dab and mask and surround. You bombard, spritz and peel, rubbing alcohol, flesh-toned clearasil that pinkens and cakes while new dirt worms shimmy beneath the pummeled surface of you. Every time you touch your face, you leave a scar. Hey, you. Every time you touch your face, you leave a scar. Eight. I'll do six. Six. <laughs> you want it all. Chicken wings with bubbled skin fried tight, salmon cakes in syrup, the most improbable parts of swine, oily sardines on saltines splashed in red spark, chitlins nurtured and scraped in Saturday assembly, buttered pie crust stuffed with sweet potatoes and sugar, gray cheese conjured from the heads of hogs. All that Dixie dirt binds, punches your insides flat, reteaches the blind beat of your days. Like mama and her mother before her, you pulse on what is thrown away. Gray hog gut stewed, improbable and limp, scrawny chicken necks merely whispering meat. You will live beyond the naysayers, your rebellious heart constructed of lard and salt, your life labored but long. You are built of what should kill you. Eight. In the bathroom of the whatnot joint on the way to school, you get rid of the starch and billowed lace, Borette's taming, unraveling braids, white knee socks, and sensible hues. From a plastic bag, you take out electric blue eyeshadow, platforms with silver glittered heels, neon fishnets, and a blouse that doesn't so much button as suggest shut. <laughs> The transformation takes five minutes, and you emerge feeling like a budding lady, but looking, in retrospect, like a blind streetwalker bursting from a cocoon. <laughs> this is what television does. Turns your mother into clueless backdrop, fills your pressed head with the probability of thrum. Your body becomes just not yours anymore. It's a dumb little marquee. Nine. With your bedroom door closed, you are a skyscraper bouffant, peach foundation, eyelashes like upturned claws. You are exuding ice, pinched all over by earrings. You are way too much woman for this room. <laughs> the audience has one chest, a single shared chance to gasp. They shudder, heave, waiting for you to take the stage and break their hearts. Opening your mouth, you become an S. Pour ache into hip swings. Tisk, tisk as the front row collapses. Damn, they want you. You lift the microphone. Something illegal comes out of you, a sound like titties and oil. Mama flings the door open with a church version of your name. <laughs> then you are pimpled, sexless, ashed, and double Dutch knees. You are spindles. You are singing into a hairbrush. Ten. This is what everybody else is doing. Skating in soul circles, skinning shins, tongue kissing in the coat room, skimming alleys for Chicago rats, failing English, math, crushing curfew, lying about yesterday and age, slipping Woolworth's bounty into an inside pocket, sprouting breast. Here's what everybody else is doing. Sampling the hotness of hooch, grinding under blue light, getting turned around in the subway, flinging all those curse words, inhaling a quick supper before supper, fried up in hot Crisco and granulated sugar, sneaking out through open windows when the night goes dark, calling mamas bitches under their breath, staying up till dawn to see what hides. Here's what you are doing. Reading. <laughs> 13. You're almost 14. And you think you're ready to push beyond the brutal wisdoms of the one and the three, but some nagging crave in you doesn't want to let go. 
You suspect that you will never be this unfinished. All hail Mary and precipice, stuttering sachet, fuses in your swollen chest suddenly lit and spitting, and you'll need to give your hips a name for what they did while you weren't there. You'll miss the pervasive fever that signals blooming, the sore lessons of jump rope in your calves. This is the last year your father is allowed to touch you. Sighing, you push Barbie's perfect body through the thick dust of a top shelf. There, her prideful heart thunders. She has hardened you well. She has taught you everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, Anissa, I have to tell you later how you changed my whole my whole idea of what I was going to read. <laughs> I it's just I just did. All right, so uh, I watch a lot of bad movies, and this uh, this poem was inspired by Clash of the Titans. <laughs> The original Clash of the Titans. The Ray Harryhausen version of Clash. Okay. So you know how you're getting ready for work and you have the TV on in the backdrop and you look and the skeletons are fighting and you go, oh, work and wait. You sit down, you watch the whole movie. And then, and then you're too embarrassed to tell people, oh, Clash of the Titans was on. So um, this, uh, this, is, this was uh, the Medusa scene. And uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, Medusa got to be Medusa the same, you know, she got in trouble the same way a lot of us do. She made love to the wrong man. And uh, she fooled around with Poseidon in Athena's temple. And Athena was like, oh no, you're dead. Uh, so she decided that she would, you know, do that thing. You know, it's like, I'll, I'll change her and, uh, you know, she'll have the snake hair and when she looks at men, she'll turn them to stone. So uh, this is a, a, a poem in Medusa's voice as her body is going through these changes. Okay. Everybody's like, oh, really? <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> Poseidon was easier than most. He calls himself a god, but he fell beneath my shaking with more shaking than any mortal. He wept when my robe fell from my shoulders. I made him bend his back for me, listen to his screams break like waves. We defile that temple the way it should be defiled, squirming and bucking our way from corner to corner. You know, Athena probably got a real kick out of that. I'm sure I'll be hearing from her. She'll give me nightmares for a week or so that I can handle, or she'll turn the water in my well into blood. I'll scream when I see it, and that'll be that. Maybe my first child will be born with the head of a fish. I'm not even sure it was worth it, Poseidon pounding away at me like a madman, losing his immortal mind because of the way my copper skin swells in moonlight. Now my arms smoke and itch. Hard scales are rising on my wrists like armor. Come on, Athena. He was just another lay and not a particularly good one at that, even though he could spit steam from his fingers. I won't touch him again, promise. And we didn't mean to drop to our knees in your temple, but our bodies were so hot and misaligned. It's not every day a gal gets the sample of God, you know that. Why are you being so rough on me? I feel my eyes twisting, the lids crusting over and boiling, the pupils glowing like red coals. Athena, woman to woman, could you have resisted him? Would you have been able to wait for the proper place, the right moment to jump those immortal bones? <laughs> now my feet are tangled with hair. My ears are gone. My back is curving and my lips have grown numb. My garden boy just shattered at my feet. Damn it, Athena! Take away my father's gold. Send me away to live with lepers. Give me a pimple or two. But my face, to have men never again gaze at my face, growing stupid in anticipation of that first touch, how can any woman live like that? 
How can I watch their warm bodies turn to rock when their only sin was desiring me? They just want to see me sweat. They just want to touch my face and run their fingers through my, my hair. Is it moving? Thank you. It was looking at me like, stop looking over here. <laughs> no, I don't know anything about your hair. Leave me alone. Uh, all right. Wow. OK. Um, this poem is, um, this, this is a, a, another persona poem. And uh, a long time ago, I had interviewed um, an undertaker. And he told me that his job, telling me about how his job had changed. Like, used to be the phone would ring, and it would be uh, in the family that he knew, and some older member of the family will have died, and he would work with the family to plan the funeral. Uh, but now he said, I'm afraid to answer the phone, because more often now, it's a young mother asking me to help her bury her son. So. Um, this is a poem in his voice about what he told me and some things I saw while I was with him. When a bullet enters the brain, the head explodes. I could think of no softer warning for the young mothers who sit double before my desk, nodding their smooth brown hands and begging, fix my boy, fix my boy. Here's his high school picture. And the mildly mustachioed player in the crinkled snapshot looks nothing like the plastic bag of boy stated in the cold room downstairs. In the picture, he is cocky and chiseled, clutching the world by the balls. I know the look. Now he is flaps of cheek. Slivers of jawbone, assorted teeth, a surprised eye, bloody tufts of napped hair, the building blocks of my business. So I turned the photo face down to talk numbers instead. The high price of miracles startles the young mother, but she is prepared. I know that she has sold everything she owns, that cousins and uncles have emptied their empty bank accounts, that she dreams of her baby in tuxedoed satin, flawless, in an open casket, a cross or blood-red rose tacked to his fingers, his halo set at a cocky angle. So I write a figure on a piece of paper and push it across to her. She stares at the number. Jesus. But Jesus isn't on my payroll. I work alone until the dim insistence of mourning, gluing, stitching, creating a chin with a brush stroke. I plump shattered skins, then paint the skin to suggest warmth and impending breath. I plop glass eyes into rigid sockets, then carve eyelids from a forearm and inner thigh. I reach into collapsed cavities to rescue a tongue, an ear. Lips are never easy to recreate. And I try not to remember the stories, the tales the mothers must tell me to ease their own hearts. Oh, they cry, my Ronnie, my Michael, my David, my Chico. He was on his way home, a dark car slowed down. They must have thought he was someone else. At a party, he stepped between two gang members. Really, he was trying to get off the streets. He was trying to pull away from the crowd. He was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Fix my boy. He was a good boy. Make him the way he was. But I have explored the jagged gaps in the boy's body, and I have sued the angry edges of bullet holes. I have touched him in places no mother knows, and I have birthed his new face. I know he believed himself invincible, that he most likely hissed before the bullets lifted him off his feet. I try not to remember his swagger, his lizard-lidded gaze, 
his young mother screaming into the phone. She says that she will find the money to bury him. And I know that is the truth that fuels her, forces her to place one foot in front of the other. Suddenly, I want to take her down to the chilly room, open the bag, and shake its terrible bounty onto the gleaming steel table. I want her to see him, to touch him, to press her lips to the flap of cheek because the woman needs to wither, finally, and move on. We both jump as the phone rattles in its hook. I pray it's my wife, a bill collector, a wrong number, but the wide questioning silence on the other end is too familiar. It's another mother needing a miracle. It's another homeboy coming home. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I've got. Do, do I have time for two more? Any? Yes. <laughs> no, I, it's, who was t I need some time. Did you finish? <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. Um, okay, I'll do this one. All right, I'll do funny, and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to do something to get us out so we're not looping nooses around our necks <laughs> when we leave here. All right, this is, uh, when I was a little girl, my father used to take me to the barber shop with him. And then uh, when my son was small, I'd take him to the barber shop. And a, bar a black barber shop on Saturday morning is a peculiar and wonderful thing. Um, there's like big balls of hair rolling around. <laughs> and there's a, a card with like fisted picks that no one's bought since 1968. <laughs> And there's another card with, the, with a, all the different hairdos with numbers on it and people who, you know, come in and say, I want to braid it, you know. And the barber talks about everybody. The barber's a, a, a notorious gossip, and there's usually a, a, a picture window, and he talks about everybody who goes by outside. And sometimes he forgets you're sitting there, he starts talking about you. It's like, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll wait till you leave, you know. <laughs> so, this is based on uh, a barber that I knew in Chicago by the name of uh, Terrell, who was always talking about how much sex he was going to have, even though he hadn't had any since the Eisenhower administration. <laughs> <laughs> Warning, mild sexual content. <laughs> well, look who comes walking into my barber shop, still wearing that Jerry curl. You know, man, it's 2000. Ain't nobody got no time for that grease trickling all down their neck, especially hot as it is out there. Come here, let me clip that stuff down. Let those naps grow out. You know, a couple of weeks, I will hook you up with a fade. The sisters don't like putting their hands in that greasy mess. And just, did y'all see that child Aretha on stage at the president's thing, trailing all that fur like she's Queen Elizabeth and all that fat underneath it? I ain't never seen no black woman with money stay fat. Chicken, see her coming? Even the bones get scared. That child will eat a spaghetti strap. What's that song she sang, Ain't No Way? Well, I guess it sure ain't. She got, she got one chance, though. If you stay alive long enough, time will make you skinny. I just don't know if she got that much time. Oh, yeah, look at that gal I was telling y'all about. Got enough butt to bounce a drink on. I'm gonna be knee deep in that come Friday night, and my name ain't Terrell Anderson Jr., and I ain't got my hand tussling in y'all nappy heads. Man, she don't know me yet, but she will. I bet she already heard about how my love making then put a few sisters on crutches. <laughs> Hide and whip some of this nature on them. Now they drooling, barking like dogs. Hell, y'all can laugh if y'all want. Thomas, you ask your sister. And you over there, <laughs> ask your mama. <laughs> they say size don't matter, but it do if it's this size, man. I have to bind this to my leg. It will scare y'all out of here. <laughs> Come next week, y'all can ask that girl y'all just seen. She be passing by that one in a wheelchair, mark my words. And Thomas, one too many times I ain't seen your wife over there across the street in the butcher shop. And the meat she asking for ain't what makes it to your table for supper. 
She's over there all behind the counter like she's interested in the butcher's business. What she's interested in is the butcher's business. And you better start taking care of business at your own home, my man, before she get a taste of that sausage she's selling. Then you'll be up here talking about, she gone, she gone. Man, I'm telling you, women are liberated nowadays. You cannot be climbing up on top of them, poking them like you got somewhere else to be in five minutes. <laughs> and every time you get a chance, there you are up in the Continental, sniffing all up Deborah Ann's young butt like she wants something from you beside that money you always waving around. Man, let me tell you, anytime you see flies buzzing around a woman, it, it ain't summer. It's time to move on to another woman. <laughs> I don't know, your, your wife got some nice legs on her though. You know, if the butcher don't take up on her, I might get in line. And wait, 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 what you talking about? What's wrong with your boy? Damn near 40 years old, no woman in sight. Could be he just ugly though. You know, the other night, I heard a blind woman turning him down. Said she could just imagine how ugly he was. <laughs> now, what are you all over there? You, you, what are you talking about some activator? Man, you better activate your head under this razor and let me cut that stuff out of there. Let me see if I can get this across to you. It's 2000. Black man, free now. <laughs> Super flood and flu. I've been doing this 40 years. This is Terrell's Afrocentric Barbershop Fade Palace and Wild Style Emporium. Now put your ass in my chair and put your head in my hands. <laughs> It's a mild sexual content crowd. <laughs> See, I was not gonna do that. This is like, I was just looking at us, looking around, I said, oh, oh yeah, well. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you again for the invitation here. Anise, thank you for being so amazing and wonderful. I'm really thrilled that we got to do this without all those other <laughs> poets we know around, just you and me this time. <laughs> um, this, uh, this was written, uh, do anybody remember Karen Finley? Yes. Karen Finley was a performance artist and um, she was a soccer mom in a neighborhood I used to live in. And so she had this writing workshop and we did a smell thing. Well, she said, go to a drugstore, find something, that a smell that reminds you of your childhood. So everybody was kind of going and finding like suntan oil and stuff, not me. Um, my mother is the cleanest person in the world, so I, I went to the cleaning aisle and I said, something here is going to remind me of growing up in my mom, and th there's a little tiny bottle of Lysol. There's a big bottle that everybody buys, then there's one with like skull and crossbones on it, you know, it's, it's, it's blood red and it's got like warnings and you're supposed to dilute it like 20 times or something. Well, my mother used to use this stuff undiluted, which explains a lot about my, uh, <laughs> my state of mind. Um, but I, I bought, you know, I bought it and I did what Karen said. I put it on cotton balls. I put it around my writing space, see if it, anything occurs to me. I thought I was going to write a poem about how, a funny poem about how clean my mother is. And then something hit me and I called my mother and I said, is this true? And she said, yeah, everybody used to do that. So that's where this poem came from. What surfaces can I use this product on? Answer. Lysol may be used on hard, non-porous surfaces throughout your home. Lysol cleans, disinfects, and deodorizes regular and non-wax floors, non-wood cabinets, sinks, and garbage pails. For painted surfaces, it is recommended that the product first be used in a small, inconspicuous area. Can Lysol be used in the kitchen? Answer. Lysol may be used on countertops, refrigerators, non-wood cabinets, sinks, stovetops, and microwave ovens. For the bathroom, it may be used for tiles, tubs, sinks, and porcelain. And for all around the house, it may be used on floors, garbage cans, in the basement, and in the garage. Can I use this inside my refrigerator? Answer. Lysol may be used on the inside of a refrigerator. However, you must remove all food and rinse well after using the product. Can I use this to kill mold and mildew? Yes. Lysol controls the growth of mold and mildew. It kills the mold, but removal of the stain associated with mold can sometimes be tough. Could I use this to scrub the uncontrollable black from the surface of my daughter to make her less Negro and somehow less embarrassing to me? She's like the hour after midnight that child is. Why, yes. Begin with one Sears gray swirl dinette set cheer screeching across the hardwood on spindly steel legs.
placed the offending child on the ruptured plastic of the seat. The man that she bend her neck to grant you access to the damaged area. You know, of course, that black begins at the back of the neck. Grab a kitchen towel, a washcloth, cloth or a sponge, and soak with undiluted Lysol concentrate. Ignoring the howls of the impossibly Negro child, scrub vigorously until the offending black surrenders. There may be inflammation, a painful rebellion of skin, or slight bleeding. This is simply the first step to righteousness. The child must be punished for her lack of silky tresses, her broad, sinful nose, that dark Negroid blanket she wears. Layers of her must disappear. Precautionary statements, danger, corrosive to eyes and skin, harmful if swallowed, causes eye and skin damage. Do not get in eyes or on skin. Wear protective eyewear and rubber gloves when handling. Woman, your mission is beyond this. You must clean the child, burn the southern sun from her. If she squirms from the hurting, demand that she hold on to the sides of the chair. Soak towel or sponge. Repeat application. I have tried to understand. Precautionary statements, my mother. Danger, her hatred of this. Corrosive to eyes and skin, of the me that wears this. Harmful of swallowed, the monster she had. Causes eye and skin damage, the monster she wanted. Do not get in eyes or on skin. Mama, can't you read it? You want me to read it to you? I, I can't help being my color. I am black. I am not dirty. I am black. I am not dirty. I am black. I am not dirty. What you have birthed upon me will not come off. My hair is black crinkled steel, too short to stay plaited. My ass is wide and will get wider. You can pinch my nose, but it will remain a landscape. You could not reverse me. What is filthy to you will never be cleansed. There is only one thing you can Change. I am not dirty. I am black. I am not dirty. I am black. I am not black. I am dirty. I am dirty. Black. Not black. I am black and dirty. Dirt is black. Black is dirty. You convinced me that I am what is wrong in this world. Scrub me right. Bleed me lighter. What is the difference between disinfection and sanitation? Why are there two different usage directions for each? Answer, according to the Environmental Protection Agency, disinfection is killing more than 99.99% of germs on hard, non-porous surfaces in 10 minutes and may pertain to a number of different types of bacteria. The EPA defines sanitation as killing 99.9% .9 of bacteria in five minutes or less. Lysol products achieve sanitation in 30 seconds. 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Done. Thank you very much.
one more time for Prime Minister of Awesome, Patricia <laughs> Smith. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, so did you all have a good time tonight? <laughs> wow, right? Wow, this is, this is why I love my job. So everybody repeat after me, November 3rd. November 3rd. That's the next Equilibrium, Lakota Dakota Poets um, Speaking Truth to Power, uh, right here, uh, Saturday, November 3rd. Thank you all so much. Um, really quickly, let's go through the gauntlet. DJ Nock, Josh in the sound booth, uh, Brownstone, Brownstone, all the photographers, all the loft staff, volunteers, interns who helped us out. Let's give them all a hand real quick. <laughs> And last but not least, put your hands together for Lorena, for Huey, for Mankwe, for Anis, and for Patricia. One more time. It is great to be here. It's great to be a part of this thing. We exist because of your support. Please continue to support us. Look us up at loft.org. Um, be a member of the loft, take a class, come to another show. We have a lot of things going on all the time. Check us out. Um, uh, the books for, and CDs of the artists are on sale for ma by Majors and Quinn. Um, we have a spoken word fellowship but, um, uh, for the first time ever for uh, people of color and Native American spoken word poets. Uh, the guidelines for that are on the Loft website. You can apply for up to $8,000 for a one-year community immersion project of your choosing. Uh, actually, Sean Webster who is here, who's one of the people who was at the focus group that helped form that uh, fellowship. It's a great opportunity. Check that out. Um, last but not least, there's pizza and, and cake. Um, so the way that we have it set up is you're going to go out and Try not to block the, the way fire hazard, okay? Um, you're gonna take a right, plates, salads, forks, um, vegan, vegan, vegetarian, chicken, red meat, red meat, red meat. And then, and then uh, you skip around the globe thing made out of books, and then there's another table, and then it's things to drink and cake. Okay, got that? So when, when you go out though, uh, do me a favor, just start with one piece, goddammit, and then, <laughs> all right? Thank you all for coming, have a great night.